Assalamu alaikum. This is Hannah Zuberi, and you're watching Muslim Network News. Our top story tonight is about Israel's ongoing oppression of Palestinians. Heavily armed Israeli soldiers escorted Jewish settlers into Al Aqsa Mosque on Sunday. This was while all Muslim worshippers under the age of 45 were barred from entering the mosque. Palestinian news agency Wafa reports that Israeli police assaulted Muslims who were performing early morning prayers there. This was to make way for Israeli settlers to storm the compound. Al Aqsa Mosque is Islam's third holiest site. Wafa said that at least six Palestinians were arrested. This included a mosque guard who was trying to film the incident. The latest attack comes as a fragile ceasefire holds in the besieged Gaza Strip, a brutal 11-day Israeli bombing campaign that began at the end of Ramadan killed at least 248 people. This includes 66 children. The attacks were preceded by forced removal of Palestinians in the Jerusalem Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. Israel destroyed close to 200 residential towers, homes, and 33 media centers in airstrikes on Gaza. Over 1,000 homes were completely or severely destroyed, and about 13,000 were partially damaged. 12 Israelis, including two children, were killed by Hamas rockets, launched in retaliation to Israel's attacks. Israel's attacks on Palestinians in Jerusalem and the Palestinian territories since the end of Ramadan are increasing anti-Semitism in the United States. Anti-Semitic incidents have been reported in some cities, including New York and Los Angeles. LA's police department reported an incident involving several men being beaten and assaulted with a deadly weapon last Tuesday. Several interfaith groups are speaking up against this violence. The Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, is the country's largest Muslim civil rights organization. CARE spokesperson Ibrahim Hooper condemned anyone who engaged in hate speech, intimidation, and violence. In the meantime, academics have also spoken up against Israeli aggression. Over 350 in North Carolina have signed a statement of solidarity to stand with the people of Palestine. 19 colleges and universities across North Carolina have also strongly condemned the Israeli attacks on historic Palestine. This followed the lead of 600 faculty and students of Georgetown University who issued similar statements last week. University of California, Berkeley also released a statement. America's newspaper of record became news itself this weekend. The New York Times ran a full page ad condemning three fashion models on Saturday. They had stood up to Israel for its war crimes. Palestinian models Gigi and Bella Hadid were attacked for showing solidarity with the people of Palestine. British Albanian pop star Dua Lipa was also singled out by the ad, which ran in the newspaper's main section. It said Lipa and Hadid's sisters are mega influencers who have vilified the Jewish state, quote unquote. The ad was produced and paid for by Rabbi Shmuley Boteik, the head of the World Values Network. In response to the criticism, Lipa wrote that Jews, Muslims, and Christians all have the right to live in peace as equal citizens of a state they choose. Many celebrities have taken to social media to post pro-Palestine messages. This includes singers Zayn Malik and The Weeknd, the Incredible Hulk actor Mark Ruffalo. U.S. media watchdog group Fairness and Accuracy in Media, or FAIR, has in the past questioned the New York Times coverage of Israel. It found that the paper has a problem with conflicts of interest. Fair said that the New York Times did not disclose that its Israel correspondent is married to someone who is hired to promote a positive media image of Israel. The correspondent's son has also served in the Israeli military. Similarly, one of the paper's veteran writers, David Brooks, has a son who served in the Israel Defense Forces. Belarus has taken its crusade against media to new heights. It used a fighter jet MiG-25 to force an Irish airline to land in Belarus yesterday. 
The plane was flying from Greece to Lithuania, where it was hijacked. Belarus police then arrested journalist Roman Protashevich, who was on the plane. He is the Polish-based political exile that was organizing last year's protest against Alexander Lukashenko. Lukashenko is the first and only president Belarus has ever seen. The communist president is the longest serving leader of a nation. European governments and the United States have expressed outrage and are protesting the arrest. Gun violence continues to wreak havoc on Americans. 20 people were shot to death across the United States last weekend. 74 were injured. Most were attending parties where they were killed or injured. Shootings took place from New Jersey to Ohio to Georgia. However, the largest number of people shot were in the Chicago area. Tuesday will mark one year since George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. The 46-year-old black man was killed last May by former white Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Chauvin had pinned him to the ground with a knee on his neck for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. This was despite Floyd's repeated pleas that he could not breathe. His murder touched off historic protests against racism and police brutality last summer across the United States. Chauvin has since been convicted of murder and manslaughter for Floyd's death. Two other officers helped to restrain Floyd. Alex King knelt on his back. Thomas Lane held down his legs. And a third officer, To Tao Tao, held back bystanders. He kept them from intervening during the roughly nine and a half minute restraint. Muslim Network TV will mark nine minutes, 29 seconds, remembering him and the struggle later in the program. An in-depth analysis on this issue is coming up later tonight in our show. So please keep watching Muslim Network TV. Americans may be relaxing on the COVID front, but the numbers indicate it may be too early to do that. About 500 people are dying of COVID every day in the United States. The cases and deaths are at the same level as last summer. The only difference this year is that close to half of Americans have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. The U.S. continues to lead the world in COVID cases and deaths. Globally, over 167 million people have been infected with the virus. Over 3 million have died from it. Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene is on the attack again. This time, she's fiercely opposing Speaker Nancy Pelosi's mask policy for the House floor. Speaking on Real America's Voice, she said that Pelosi is mentally ill and likened the mask policy to the Holocaust. This is the continuation of misinformed and controversial comments she has made since the Capitol riot on January 6th. Green has been removed from House committee positions this year due to her support for conspiracy theories and anti-Semitic statements. She was one of the seven members of the House who were given formal warnings for not wearing masks. Green has been told that further violations will result in a fine. Caste discrimination is alive and well in the United States. The venue, tech company Cisco Systems headquarters in San Jose. A group of employees say they have received less pay and fewer job opportunities because of their caste. Their complaints only resulted in further punitive actions. All of the employees are Dalits who were on the lowest rung of the caste system. The managers accused of discrimination at Cisco are higher caste Hindus. The case became public after the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing sued Cisco. It accused the company of racial discrimination in July 2020. India banned the caste system in 1950. However, caste discrimination has continued. Socioeconomic oppression against Dalit has persisted for decades and has done lasting damage to this group. It has also been exported through its diaspora communities in the United States and other parts of the world. Part of the problem is connected to groups like the Washington, D.C.-based Hindu American Foundation, 
it is at the forefront of upholding the caste system. It is also part of a larger network that denies the existence of caste discrimination and is deeply violent history through religious sanctions. Saudi Arabia's Al Watan newspaper reports that Hajj will be performed under strict health measures this year. The announcement did not give the number for the pilgrims that will be allowed. However, the allowance applies to pilgrims from both within Saudi Arabia and outside. Last year, a little over 1,000 pilgrims were allowed under strict health guidelines due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pilgrims from outside of the country were not permitted. The announcement follows the decision of the Ministry of Hajj and Umrah on May 9th. Australian scientists are pointing to seaweed as a possible way to save the planet. Dr. Pia Winberg said that seaweed can play a major role in reversing climate change. Her finding is based on its rapid growth rate and ability to absorb carbon many times faster than terrestrial plants. There are three species of seaweed. Each is identified by its color, which can be red, yellow, or brown. The edible and more useful species is brown, which is known as kelp. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned, and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk a mile in my shoes Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid Walking up and down the world's largest refugee camps I met Sister Fatima well, I'm calling her a sister. She was just a teenage girl, my granddaughter's age. Her parents were slaughtered by the Burmese military and she was dragged by the Burmese soldiers to their hut and all night long she was violated. She lost consciousness when she regained and in the morning and soldiers were themselves away, she ran and hid in a vegetable patch. Some people saw her, gave her clothes, and took her four day long walk to Bangladesh. Who will speak up for her? Who will stand up for her if not you and I? It's our responsibility. It's our duty, brothers and sisters in humanity. And that's why I like you to support Burma Task Force. I'm a volunteer for it. But Burma Task Force is standing up to stop this genocide, violation of our sisters. You and I are free. They are not. Please stand up. Work with Burma Task Force and donate today to Burma Task Force. Together, we can do it. Assalamu alaikum. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Welcome back. Talking about Israeli oppression in Palestine, Human Rights Watch and Bet Salam is calling Israel an apartheid state. To discuss this in detail and to draw a comparison with the South African apartheid, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid, who is with the former Minister for Intelligence Services in South Africa and a leading member of the African National Congress during the apartheid era. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. South African apartheid was there, there was a big struggle, and it was defeated. 
now that people have started using uh, apartheid vocabulary, it was there. Uh, many, many people, including President Carter, wrote uh, Palestine, peace, not apartheid. But this year, Beth Salim started uh, accusing Israel of apartheid. Then came Human Rights Watch. And they also accuse Israel of crimes against humanity and apartheid. So South Africa is coming into the news because one old friend Israel here. And to discuss that uh, more about uh, how was the apartheid defeated in South Africa is someone who knows. He has been a minister of intelligence services in South Africa. And um, Ronnie, Gas rails. Welcome. Thank you, Shukran. It's lovely to be with you from Johannesburg, <laughs> South Africa. Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, tell me, and me being in Chicago, we seems to be twin cities in some ways. Uh, but, but tell us, uh, Amin, you were Minister of Intelligence Services in South Africa. So you probably saw the new files and the old files. So what is your assessment how apartheid was defeated? Oh, well, it's not just from being Minister of Intelligence uh, after we won our freedom. I was involved in the South African struggle against apartheid, settler colonialism, racism, from uh, my late teens, 20 year old, at the time of the Shafal massacre, uh, that's 1960. And uh, it was a tough struggle. Um, for years, people in the world said that it was impossible for a people without weapons, without resources, the overwhelming population were black indigenous African, but there was a very sizable population of 5 million whites, 10% um, of the population, who were highly trained, incredible military resources, advanced economy, a country with um, modernized communication systems, etc. Um, and it seemed an impossibility the way the the black people were kept down. Um, and the world, the Western countries, Britain, France, the usual suspects, it was then West Germany, the um, United States of America, they called uh, the, us terrorists. They supported the apartheid regime um, to the hilt. And every time the people rose up, as we see with the Palestinians, they were put down in a bloody manner. So there were people who felt it's impossible, it's never going to happen. And of course, the racist rulers and the five million whites of the, the, the white community could only vote in elections. They could only elect the only people who could elect government and so on, and were very much wealthier than the downtrodden, of course. They were cock a hoop, arrogant. Uh, white supremacist, as we see in the United States, or we see in Israel um, and, and parts of, of Europe, that white supremacist attitude. But in the end, it collapsed like a house of cards. And we clearly can point to two major elements. The one was the South African Intifada, the resistance, the political military struggle in South Africa. The second was that this was reinforced, supported by an international community of people all over the world, from Europe to Asia, India to South and North America, in Australia, New Zealand, the whole of Africa and in the metropolitan parts of Europe, all over, the peoples of those countries, the, the, the West Europeans, of course, as I've mentioned, and the North Americans, Canada and the United States, they backed apartheid. But we mobilized these forces internationally who saw the moral justice of the cause of the people. And the approach was boycott, isolate, racist apartheid South Africa, the development of what 
Palestinian civil society and the international community have today. BDS, three words, boycott, divestment, sanctions. That organized tremendous pressure on the apartheid regime. The white population felt it in the end um, as they were cut off from the world. Uh, the trade was was blocked. The, the, the products of business from South Africa, the fruits, the vegetable, the, the wines and so on, housewives all over the world boycotted them in, 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 the, in the shops of Europe and so on. And uh, the, the love of the white South African sport, rugby, cricket and so on, uh, they couldn't tour after the 1970s or so. They were stopped in their tracks by people in the, the rugby cricket nations from Ireland to Scotland and England and Wales, Australia, New Zealand and France. They couldn't carry on with their cricket tours, their sports tours, their cultural events and so on. And the sanctions affected them very deeply, uh, which is why in the end, the Angolan and the Cuban people could beat this mighty, powerful South African racist defense force in battle. But the political, military, the resistance and international solidarity, these were the absolute weapons which pulverized South African racism and forced them to negotiate. And incidentally, to finally say, pressurized the Thatcher, the Reagan governments, um, the French governments and so on, by the people in those countries demanding that the government should not support apartheid South Africa. Could it be that the presence of large number of African American in the United States and absence of South African lobby in the United States allowed people of goodness to rise and influence the US policy, unlike the Israelis who have a better, strong, solid, um, uh, lobbying the United States. Yes. Well, Zionism has managed to build up over the years um, very powerful influence, as we know, in the United States, in particular, the major ally of Israel. And of course, in Britain and France and Austria, Germany and so on, and playing on the Holocaust. Um, but we can see that is now on the wane. The, uh, the Zionists in America are having problems now with their own young Jews under the age of 30 or so, who are becoming disenchanted with that approach. And they're becoming highly embarrassed and morally of concern about how Israel suppresses Palestinian rights. Let me say, what helped to change the whole mood in the United States in relation to apartheid South Africa was, of course, young people, the trade unions, but the black lobby from the time of the civil rights movement right through the 70s and very much into the 80s, African Americans became very important in the pressure on the American government. And Congress passed the anti-apartheid laws, which Reagan was refusing to sign. This was pushing America into changing its policy. What we need to see in the United States and elsewhere, but let me focus on the United States, the Palestinian, the Arab diaspora is growing. It's getting to rival and outnumber, for instance, and I'm I'm not talking about us having to be anti-Jewish. It's anti-Zionism, anti-Israel. It's not anti-religion or anti-Jewish people. But that mobilization, that responsibility of Muslims everywhere, but particularly in places from France and Germany, throughout Europe and Britain, and in the United States, Canada, to mobilize for a just cause, peaceful mobilization. The BDS is a peaceful movement. It's not terrorism. They try to, to ban it and restrict it. The masses of the people must demand freedom of expression and assembly. And, and they win over 
more and more the progressive forces from the workers to the students and intellectuals and faith groups in those countries to create a mighty solidarity internationalist force behind the Palestinian people, not anti-Jewish, anti an apartheid state, a Zionist settlement, colony. It's a colonial settlement, that whole project. And the world is long sick and tired of colonial powers, which is why they switched their approach to talk about the Palestinians being terrorists and using the terrorist aspect. In fact, the way the apartheid regime used terrorism, used the anti-communist bogey to frighten people, the whites in South Africa, the international community, especially the West, who would fall for that. And, and, and it was part of the West, Western colonial consciousness anyway. Um, but it, it's, it's this question then, of the mobilization of those forces. And, and we will win, the Palestinians are winning this latest crisis as, as much as they've done such damage to young children killing oh, 60 or more. Women, 30 women, over 230 people in Gaza, the West Bank, 27 people in the sacred city of Jerusalem and within Israel itself. But they, they've they lost they, and they, they're losing the war because what Netanyahu and the attempts at kicking out of their homes the people of East Jerusalem, um, Sheikh Jarrah, is that they have succeeded in uniting the Palestinian people of Gaza, the West Bank, inside Israel, within the refugee camps, in the diaspora. They are coming together. And what is Zionist Israel's strategy and attempts, supported by America and those Western powers I've mentioned, was to try and expunge this idea of a Palestinian national liberation struggle against, against apartheid. Um, and to keep them like the apartheid government in South Africa, to keep the African people fragmented into Bantustans, to prevent them coming together for their national unity and aspirations. We see that having been achieved as never before within uh, the Palestinian territories and within the Zionist entity. And that's a great victory. Well, thank you so much, Rani Kasrels. Shukran, salam alaikum. Thanks Malik. for having me. Nice Peace to meet you. Good Peace. luck. Back to you, Hina. Thank you, Imam Mujahid. Before moving on to our next analysis, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back after these messages. Our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Friends, our world is pulling together like never before. 
We're making huge sacrifices to keep one another safe. Scientists are working non-stop to develop COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. A vaccine will get our economies moving. It will tell our loved ones we're safe again. But we have challenges we must address. Right now, huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. Bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. One year after George Floyd's murder, there's still many questions to be asked, many aspects to be discussed, and most importantly, systematic changes that need to be brought to our society. To discuss this in detail, let's go to Saleha Farouk. Over to you, Saleha. Thank you so much, Hannah. As always, today we're very happy to be joined by Marguerite Hill, who is a co-founder as well as executive director of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, also known as Muslim ARC. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Marguerite. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Now, you might be aware that this weekend, a lot of protesters across the United States had gathered to mark the first anniversary of the death of George Floyd, of course. It has been quite a long and painful year for his family and for so many others who felt equally affected by the events of his death. So I just wanted to get your perspective on this one year later. Please talk to us about the national sentiment today. How are people feeling across the country? Yeah, I mean, across the country, um, we're still seeing a lot of the polarization, right? And, um, you know, as far as within within the Black community, there still is um, a lot of outrage around um, his murder. And um, there still is a lot of outrage that, that it continues, right? Where you had um, Dante Wright and Adam Toledo and... Um, you know, there, there's just still police killings. And so, um, you know, the struggle still continues and you still have people that are, that are in denial. So, so as far as sen sentiment, it still is divided um, across uh, along racial lines, as far as like where um, there are many white Americans and those from um, conservatives who feel 
that um, that um, Officer Chauvin got um, a bad rap. And so that is still concerning that we still have that racial divide, even though we saw his murder thousands of times and there still are means that show um, the imagery of, of his killing. Of course, thank you so much for that. Now, as you mentioned, one year later, so many conversations about his death, including what it's meant for everybody, uh, including, of course, uh, keeping in mind the recent guilty verdict uh, that came out of uh, the, the officer, of course, that took his life. Now, in the rallies during this weekend, people were asking the question, what has changed? From your perspective at an anti-racism nonprofit, uh, what have you seen changed? And at the same time, what changes do you think need to be brought about uh, in society? Yeah, so, you know, there, there has been a lot that has changed and then there's a lot that hasn't changed, right? So as far as like public awareness has, has changed a lot around, you know, because that was just so hyper visible, um, you know, his murder was definitely shocking. And, and so, um, the the awareness that these things that do happen and that we must stand up um this also did happen in the middle of a pandemic and we're still in that pandemic where um but now you know things are opening up but last year what definitely changed was just to see the largest social movement um in support of the up um, uprising for black lives so that really transformed how uh, civil society sees itself and being able to show up in force to address uh, violent policing. Uh, the other things that hasn't changed, right, is that, is that you still have, like I said, the polarization that you have one party that is really pushing to, to, uh, push out even the the type of analysis that highlights how the issue of George Floyd's murder is systemic, right? And so you still have a lot of those racial disparities that led to the vulnerability of George Floyd and, and many other Black men. So that still exists. And um, you still have a society that hasn't fully addressed racial disparities. While there, there are gestures on one side of, of the political spectrum towards addressing racial disparities, there's still a lot of pushback. And we have so we have many, many miles to go in really addressing that. Now, when thinking about George Floyd's tragic murder and of course the guilty verdict that came out of it, what are Americans hoping from Washington? In other words, are people seeking changes in federal law and what are those changes that you hope might come out of government? Yeah, I think for on the federal level, the, the activists that are working on that level, many of them recognize some of the, the challenges, right, of looking for federal policies when, when, when these, you know, the, the atrocities happen on the local level. And that's where a lot of the power is, that's where a lot of the accountability. And so for on the federal level is really making sure that the federal government is, is investigating uh, local police forces, right, and and ensuring that they're enacting um, accountability towards the community, and whether that's civilian oversight or if there are uh, police officers that are part of white supremacist groups, right, or part of hate groups. So we saw that in January sixth, where there were police officers that per uh, participated in the riot. And so that is something that is significant, right? And so what I think on the federal level is um, really holding um, into account the police force, um, having, um, making sure that um, there's no qualified immunity. So the George Floyd Act is something that many are pushing, right? And and so, you know, there are, like I said, there there are many challenges to, even for that. And then there's people that are really pushing for more to really address like the deep systemic and not really look at it as like, oh, we have to reform or, or tinker with this aspect of policing, but really get at its core. 
Now, your organization, the Muslim Anti-Racism Collective, uh, also does a lot of activity in the field of anti-oppressive and anti-discrimination work in North America, specifically in the United States. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your professional opinion on what work you think needs to be done uh, for the purpose of perhaps social healing, building awareness, prevention, and maybe even re reconciliation for his family, as well as so many others from racialized backgrounds that also feel equally affected. Yeah, the as an education organization, we truly do believe in education for liberation. And that includes media literacy, recognizing that much of the media that's happening that 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 we see, right? And we're seeing this polarization of media and distortions around the truth and, and challenges where where um, some media outlets uh is they are not reporting truth, right? They're really having spins on truth, right? They're they're kind of repeating certain uh, narratives, like dominant narratives about communities, and and um, you know even really trying to make sure that anti-racism isn't in in our education institutions as long as they're federal funded funded. So what we really have to do is really begin to organize for more truth telling and to make sure that those pushes fr coming from uh, more conservative elements of our society, which really would like to dismiss critical race theory, which is really about the legal structures of racism, like how racism shows up in our legal systems, right? And and that there are people that are really trying to push that out as far as from, from elementary schools, high schools, and even colleges. Like they want to ban that work and they want to ban anti-racism studies. They want to ban anti-racism trainings in all institutions that uh, get received federal funding. So for, for us as an education organization, we really have to push for more organizing for anti-racism and to make sure that the, our, the audiences that are receiving messages that they could push back on media outlets and call them into account for, you know, to speak truth to these issues. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I wanted to get your take on how George Floyd is being seen in, in society. Many people do see him as someone who is just uh, who is a lot more than just a victim of police brutality in terms of what his murder uh, represents and his memory and his legacy and what might come out of it, as of course you're, you're, you've mentioned a lot during this interview. So in your opinion, what has George Floyd come to represent in American society now and perhaps for the future? future as well. I mean, for, for me, I mean, I, he, he looks like a relative, right? I mean, and, and in fact, you know, his story definitely reaches um, really close to home um, for me as knowing my brothers had similar encounters of being held down. I mean, family members have experienced that. There's not one Black person we don't know who has not faced some type of like potential threat, like a deadly encounter from law enforcement. And I think that awareness that you could be um, a regular person, right? And, 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 and your life could be taken within nine minutes and, and people could watch and other, uh, other officers could watch. And so, so I think that for, for many people um, moving beyond the horror of watching his murder is recognizing he is a person, right? And and that he's all of us who who are vulnerable, even if we are complying with orders. So, um, you know, honoring his life, right, is is not just honoring him as just a martyr, but um, as a person who who has even ties with another victim of a, you know, with Emmett Till and connecting that across generations and Emmett Till who, who was lynched, like who was murdered um, and sparked the civil rights movement. And so that it's like the role that each of us plays right in, in this work. I think that's what, what, and for many of us, he, he represents is a regular person who can inspire all of us and that we're all connected and, and it's like, you know, and to hear from his family and his life story has been very powerful in, in humanizing victims of police brutality and over-policing. Um, 
from your perspective, of course, at a anti-racism collaborative, how do you think are the best ways to, for people to get out there and to get their voice out there, whether it's um, protesting, uh, peaceful demonstrations, what have you seen uh, been the most effective modes of communication to get people's opinions out there and to start that transmission for change? Yeah, um, being able to protest, right, is something that is embedded in in our constitution and bill of rights, and and that does show uh, public opinion, right? And to see the mass movements is something that's important. So you could have this mass mobilization, and that mass mobilization could show popular opinion, um, and tied to many of the mass mobilizations are teach-ins. And, and mobilizing people where they start to, to hold their public officials, those who are elected into office into account. And so that's, that's absolutely important that there is a follow-up to that where um, people are making calls to their elected officials when they're writing letters, when they show up to town halls and commissions. Those are things that I hope to do more of, right? And and so that includes getting getting on the phone and and, and calling. Um, there are online petitions, right? Which which actually can turn into um, things that are printed out and distributed and shared to elected officials. So it's absolutely important that we do that and that we get out the vote. So we have to move not just to the federal votes, but we have to think about local elections. We have to think about um, mid-year votes. And I know like this is, you know, we just finished, um, you know, our 2020 election, but there's things that we could still do now to let people know it's like, hey, we, we will hold you into account and that we will question how you support particular laws and acts because those elected officials are, are acting on, um, you know, on our behalf. And so sometimes they may fall under other pressures, but it's absolutely important that, that we do that and that we build power through together as a collective. Of course. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time here with us today. I'm speaking with Marguerite Hill, who is the co-founder as well as executive director of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative or Muslim ARC. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for being with Thank us today, you. Marguerite. Okay. Thank you. Our pleasure. Have a great day. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning, tuning in. And back to Hena Zuberi in the newsroom. Thank you so much, Saleha and Marjorie. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Keep watching Muslim Network TV. And for more, visit our website, muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.